One, two, many, many one, many two, many, many. When children learn to count, at some point, they know one and two, but anything more than that is just many. We may smile at this, but, but as adults, we have a very similar relationship with infinity. It is perplexing, but don't worry, I can explain it to you in just two words. Infinite means not finite. That's all it means. <laughs> yeah. So we have this mind-boggling concept of bigger than anything we can imagine. We could have called it ultra-mega thingamajig, but the scientists were like, nah, we'd rather just call it not a finite. <laughs> That's so frustrating. They don't even tell us what it is, only what it's not. But it's also brilliant, because it leaves room for our imagination, for filling in the details. It's like UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are way more interesting than identified ones, or, you know, birds, planes, Mega Mindy. <laughs> Likewise with infinity. It has inspired generations of mathematicians, philosophers, artists. So now, do we know anything more about infinity than that it's not a finite? My question tonight is, can we count infinity? Yeah, some of you laugh, but I know some of you are thinking, no, counting infinity, is she barking mad? Well, if you have this intuition, you are in good company. Galileo Galilei thought like this. He considered the natural numbers, one, two, three, and so on. There are infinitely many finite numbers. That's already borderland paradoxical. But Galilei went on. He thought also about the even numbers, two, four, six, and so on. Also infinitely many. So can we compare them? On the one hand, Galilei said, clearly, there are equally many natural numbers and even numbers. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. One corresponds to two, two corresponds to four, three corresponds to six, and so on. It's like getting on a bus where exactly all the seats are taken. You don't have to count the people to know there are equally many passengers and seats. Okay, but on the other hand, Galilei said, clearly there are fewer even numbers than natural numbers. The even numbers are just a part of the natural numbers. It's like getting on a bus full of teenagers sitting there with their huge, odd backpacks. You don't have to count the people to know there are fewer pe people seated than there are seats. But now, two things cannot be at the same time equal in size and different. That is a paradox, from which Galilei concluded, we cannot compare infinities, they're all many. But maybe, some of you have the intuition that there really are equally many natural numbers and even numbers. Maybe this is what you have been taught in mathematics class. If you have this intuition, you are in good company. The German mathematician Cantor developed the theory for this. If you want to be on team Cantor, I have to tell you the secret knock to get into the clubhouse. It goes like this. One, two, no, wait, this is going to take forever. I'll better tell you the password. It is cardinality. It is the word that Cantor used for size. The notion of size that takes the fact that there is this one-to-one -one correspondence to be decisive, to assign equal size to the natural numbers and the even numbers. But Cantor also showed that there really are bigger sets the real numbers, for instance, have a larger cardinality. Since then, mathematicians have accepted some infinities are just bigger than others. There is many, 
and there's many, many. But maybe some of you still have the intuition that there really are fewer even numbers than natural numbers. If you have this intuition, you are in good company. <laughs> I have this intuition too, but more importantly, Vieri Benci, a mathematician working in Pisa, just like Galilei did centuries ago, developed the theory for this. And I will tell you the secret pass password for Team Benci. It's numerosity. Numerosity is Benci's word for size, which takes the fact that the even numbers are a part of the natural numbers to be decisive, to assign a smaller size to them. Numerosity agrees with cardinality that there is many, and there's many, many, but in between there is many one, many two, and so on. Now, the paradox is avoided because we now have different words for two aspects of size, and cardinality is a more coarse-grained notion, whereas numerosities are more fine-grained. Oh, all this thinking about infinity. It really reminds me of shadow boxing. You know shadow boxers? They, they look as if they are attacking an invisible opponent, but it's not like that. They are training. They want to be well prepared for the next time they meet a real-world attacker. Thinking about infinity is like that. It is great training for thinking about confusing concepts. It's about dodging the paradoxes and aiming for clarity. That is very useful in science, of course. Just think about the visible universe. It contains many, many galaxies, each of which contain many, many stars. These are huge but finite numbers. But some physical models tell us that outside the visible part, the universe is truly infinite. And we know that it is expanding. So it's already infinite and getting even bigger. It may continue to do so for all of eternity. If we really are a part of this infinity, getting infinitely bigger still, we'd better start shadow boxing. One, two, many, many one, many two, many, many. Sylvia Wehrmacher.